words of the Torah. Baruch atah Yehovah Eloheinu melech adalem asher kishenu b'mitzvotav v'tzivenu lo'asak ben derei Torah. Please, Yehovah, make the Torah's words sweet in my mouth and in the mouth of all your people, the house of Israel. May we, your children, all of Israel, know your name in the name of your Messiah, Yeshua. And may we study your Torah simply because it is good. Best are you, Yehovah, who gave us the Torah of truth. Amen. Are you ready for your medicine? We who live in the shelter of Elyon spend our nights in the shadow of Shaddai, who say to Adonai, our refuge, our fortress, our God in whom we trust. He will rescue us from the trap of the hunter and from the plague of calamities. He will cover us with his pinions, and under his wings we will find refuge. His truth is a shield and protection. We will not fear the terrors of night or the arrow that flies by day or the plague that roams in the dark or the scourge that wreaks havoc at noon. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it won't come near us. Only keep our eyes open, and we will see how the wicked are punished. For we have made Adonai the Most High, who is our refuge, our dwelling place. No disaster will happen to us. No calamity will come near our tent. For he will order his angels to care for us and guard us wherever we go. And they will carry us in their hands so that we won't trip on a stone. We will tread down lions and snakes, young lions and serpents. We will trample underfoot. Jehovah says, because he loves me, I will rescue him. Because he knows my name, I will protect him. He will call on me and I will answer him. And I will be with him when he is in trouble. I will extricate him and bring him honor. <clears throat> I will satisfy him with long life and show him my salvation. Amen. Glory to God. You may be seated. We're in lesson four of the tree of life. We've been going through the tree of life. Even our brother on Saturday talked about the importance of soil. So we know we're on the right track when the Spirit of God is talking in different <clears throat> directions. Glad to see Sister Gail back raised from the dead. Amen. God is a miracle working God. When we look at this tree of life, we're now headed toward the roots. We talked about the soil being the most important part of the tree because without the soil being cultivated, being broke up, then nothing can grow in it. We also talked about the seed, the importance of seed. We understood that the seed is, according to the law in Deuteronomy, is not to be mingled. And we understood that not only agriculturally, but we also understood it spiritually. You cannot mingle seed. If you do, you defile the crop. And so that has a natural understanding and also a spiritual understanding. <clears throat> so now we move from soil to ground, the most important, cultivate to prepare, the seed. The seed, we also know that in order for anything to germinate, the seed must die in order to produce. So what must we do? Die. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives with me. You know what that means? You are dead. And the only one that is to live within you is him. <clears throat> so now we've come to the roots. And the roots, as we have studied the roots, as we continue to study the roots, we will explore tonight two specific functions of the root. Number one function of the root is the absorption of water and inorganic nutrients. The second function of a root is to anchor the plant body to the ground. <clears throat> I could stop there and we could talk about that spiritually because the only way that you can really grow is if you have this absorption of water and also nutrients. And we also know that there has to be an anchoring of that plant to the ground. You have to be able to be part of a community in order and be part of <clears throat> the, the relationship that God has in order to be able to function and to be able to be stable. So without a root system, the plant will just kind of blow away. It has to have some stability. It has to have a foundation. So we know that the seed germinates. We talked about that last week about germination, and we went through the understandings of the plant. And so <clears throat> what we discussed was is that the plant, or the seed, I should say, sends down a radical root into the ground and finds the water source and then anchors it to the tree <clears throat> uh, 
so that the tree can then sprout. If it's not anchored, the tree is no purpose of sprouting because it's just going to fall over. So once it grows down, it grows up. Everyone say that with me. Once it grows down, it grows up. Once you grow down, once you have a radical root where you're finding water and nutrients, where you're reading the Word of God, having the Spirit of God, <clears throat> having a relationship with God, then you can grow up. A lot of our problem sometimes is that we're growing up without the radical root. You've been in church for 20 years, been in church for 40 years. You've been <clears throat> in ministry all those times, but we uh, for however long. But the thing is, if you are not growing down that foundation, then anything that comes our way can blow us away. Anything that comes our way can destroy us. So the root's intention is to seek out and find food and water. And while on this mission, it sends out branches that provide this underground infrastructure of support. So it's going down, finding water, finding nutrients, and also then spreading out so that it could be a great foundation. And anyone who's ever tried to <clears throat> pull up a tree or a, a, a root um, or a weed that has gotten a hold and spread out, you all know it's really hard to get them up because they have spread themselves out. They don't want to leave. They want to stay. So the roots become the very foundation by which the tree can grow to its full significance. Your foundation <clears throat> will bring you to the conclusion of your full destiny, your full purpose, your full uh, significance, what, what the potential it has. Uh, if you've ever planted anything, <clears throat> if you have not done, again, the soil and then allowing the seed to die and then allowing it to do what it's supposed to do, it, you might get a tree, you might get a bush, but you won't get its full uh, potential. Has anyone ever said, well, I planted that and mine don't look like that? Well, there's some reasons why your plant don't look like that. And one is probably because you let me plant it, which means I just did enough dirt to move in it, throw a seed in, cover it up, and pray that Yehovah does what needs to be done. But there's more work in it, right? <clears throat> there's more sweat equity. There's more things you have to do. So there are two main threats. We understand that the, the, the seed or the root has to <clears throat> do its purpose of anchoring. It also has to find water and nutrients. But there are two threats to the survival of roots. And when we talk about this in the natural, I really want you to allow your mind to go to the spiritual life because it is so significant in our spiritual lives how this relates. <clears throat> so the two main threats to the survival of roots, first of all, is when a plant grows too large for its container, it becomes root-bound with no room for additional growth. And then once it's reached its potential, it starts to what? It starts to die, okay? And what happens if you've ever pulled out that plant from that smaller container <clears throat> and looked at the root? What does the root do? When it's in too small of a container, what does that root do? It begins to go in a circle and become tangled and become matted, <clears throat> and it continues to grow in a circle, a circle, a circle. Now, we know that this could also be related to the church. What has the church done? It has remained in the container that it thought it needed to be in, and now it just grows in circles. Never wanting to be repotted. Okay, I'm sorry you have trouble hearing me, but that's... That was my phone telling them I had trouble hearing me. <clears throat> the church has gone in circles. When, you know, when they went and they were supposed to go to the promised land and they didn't go in the promised land because of their lack of faith and their fear, they went back out and continued to do what? Around the mountain. And what happens as they continue to go around the mountain? And that was wilderness. For 40 years, what had to happen before anyone could go back into the promised land? <clears throat> a generation had to die. And so we are in the middle of a, a church moment, a church age that has been tangled and matted and have been growing in circles, and God has been coming to reveal some truth, and you are either going to be a church 
who, <clears throat> like we have chosen, to, re, to be re, uh, rooted and taken up and replanted into a larger container so that we no longer go around in circles or you are just going to continue to allow your roots to be matted and tangled and eventually will die. So those roots that travel in this circular fashion become actually a noose and ultimately choke the very tree that they are trying to support. Maybe in your own personal life, how many times have you just gone around the same circle? <clears throat> so these root-bound plants placed in the ground without the roots unraveled or even trimmed often fail to overcome their choked condition. So even if I took you out of your smaller pot and <clears throat> was going to replant you into a larger pot, if I just replanted you with the roots already encircled and entangled and didn't bother to unravel them or untangle them, then even though it, they're in a bigger pot, it's still going to choke itself out. So what do you have to do? You have to cut them, right? You have to, you have to kind of, <clears throat> you know, take a pair of scissors and cut around so you can get that 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 root from going around circles. So those those roots can start dangling so that they can now, in a new pot, find nutrients, find water. So the result is that plants' growth, <clears throat> if they're entangled and matted, is stunted and their potential is also uh, stopped and ultimately leads to their death. So they can be in the pot, they can be getting the water, they can be getting the sun, but because of the roots and the way that they are and they continue to go in circles and they're not willing to be repotted, and they're not willing to grow and they're not willing to stretch and they're not willing to hear the word of God and to <clears throat> move beyond where they are, they end up dying. The second threat to the survival of roots is root rot. And root rot usually is the result of overwatering and is usually lethal and when you have a plant that has been overwatered and now is in root rot, it usually is uh, at a place where there's no treatment. It will die. Now, the excess water makes it difficult for the roots to get air that they need and then makes them rot. And we need the Spirit of God to what? Breathe in us. <clears throat> and if you will not allow the Spirit of God to breathe in you, then your roots rot. And we previously identified three elements that work in the perfect balance in order to sustain the life of the seed. And we said those three elements were soil, also sunlight, and also water. Correct? And then we related them to the Father, the Son, and the Spirit of God. And these stimulated um, and supported the, the soil, the sunlight, the water. It will then cause that seed to germinate and send forth these roots that need to, that need to have stability and anchor itself. Now, the seed that has begun to send out its roots requires oxygen. When you make your move toward God and you want to follow him and you want to do what he wants you to do, <clears throat> you're going to have to allow yourself, once you start growing, to have oxygen, to allow the spirit of the living God to, to breathe in you, to, to bring life to you. And a lack of oxygen reduces root respiration, which affects its ability to synthesize sunlight which means it cannot allow the sunlight to do what it's supposed to do. How many church folk sitting here either root bound or root rot or not allowing the sunlight because they're not allowing the ruach, no matter how much word they get, no matter how much relationship they seem to have with people or the church or the organization, <clears throat> they are not receiving that sunlight that is able to do what it's supposed to do because it doesn't have the air. It's being choked out. So we have to make sure that we don't have this lack of oxygen. We have to make sure that 
<clears throat> this tree of life that we have um, is growing powerful. It's growing strong. If plants don't get a precise balance of air, water, and sunlight, then they cannot survive. If you cannot get the balance of the Father and the Son and the Spirit of God, you cannot survive. In the Jewish culture, <clears throat> they have um, a lot of the Father, just for a lack of understanding, a lot of the Father, the Torah, correct? But they don't have the Son, the Messiah, correct? <clears throat> and I wouldn't say they don't have the Spirit, but I'm saying in the fullness that they could have the Spirit, they don't have Him because of not having the Son. So therefore, they become very rigid, and it becomes <clears throat> very legalistic, right? Because you can follow the Torah um, <clears throat> out, of, out of obedience, but when you follow the Torah out of compulsion, then it becomes legalistic. I follow the Torah because I love the Father. I don't do it because I have to. I do it because I want to. And I do it because I want to because I've accepted Yeshua as my Savior. And the Spirit of God then allows me to be able to do that. And perfectness? No. But I'm trying, correct? <clears throat> I'm not shutting out. And then we have sometimes in the church where they don't want anything to do with the Father, even though they say they do, but the Father's commandments and who He is and the nature and character of Him. <clears throat> but they will receive the, the Messiah or the Son, but some church folk won't receive the Ruach. And so they're not able to really grow. And then you have those that sometimes just all they want is spirit. No structure, no commandments, just be led by this, be led by that. I feel this, I feel that. And they're wacky also. <clears throat> so we need a balance, right? We need who? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What do we need? We need the soil, we need the sunlight, and we need the water. <clears throat> so this is uh, an example of a relationship between three critical elements that are working in perfect harmony. And when you read the Word of God about perfect harmony, we see the fivefold ministry working in perfect harmony. We see the fruit of the Spirit working in perfect harmony. We see <clears throat> the gifts of the Spirit working in what? Perfect harmony. In order for them to really be what they're supposed to be within the church and also in our lives, we have to allow them to work in perfect harmony. So the same lesson that we talked about last week <clears throat> Uh, dealing with the seeds um, has to do with God's or Yehovah's economy. And in Yehovah's economy, <clears throat> he repeats that which is important so that we understand the significant role of all parts working together in perfect harmony. So over and over and over and over and over again. And really, when you look at Acts chapter 2, <clears throat> they were in the upper room together in what? In one accord. doesn't mean they were all clones of one or the other. It means that they were in one accord of the purpose and the reasoning and what was going on at that moment, right? We all come together. We're all different. We were made up of different uh, thinking processes. We have different characters. We have <clears throat> uh, different uh, lifestyles, if you would. Some are more conservative, some are more uh, in the middle, some are, you know, maybe even a little bit more liberal than maybe some conservatives would be. <clears throat> but we're here for one purpose. And what is that purpose? You don't know why you're here? To have relationship with the Father, right? The Son, the Spirit of God, and also to have relationship with one another so we can work and walk this tour out. Because if you isolate yourself, you cannot walk the Torah out. Because how can you love your neighbor if you don't have a neighbor? And how do you know what love is unless you've been challenged in that love, right? <clears throat> so you know really you love someone when you're challenged with that someone and you still love them. So the same way that we suffer when we do not break the uh, <clears throat> unhealthy patterns in our lives, a plant will root rot when not normally um, survive, won't normally survive, because it's going through the same cycle. So we have patterns. We have <clears throat> things that we continually do all the time, all the time, all the time, all the time. doesn't seem to be able to break it. doesn't seem, you know, we're always angry, we're always mad, we're always speaking this, always speaking that, always doing this, <clears throat> and never having a moment where we break that cycle. And eventually we're going to suffocate ourselves and, 
and entangle ourselves. And here's Yehovah who wants to do a great thing for us, but yet we're allowing our root to rot. We've examined the ground that the seed is planted in and investigated the seed itself. We, we said that you just can't throw a seed into any ground, soil, dirt, correct? And the dirt is the most important. It must be cultivated. The hardness of it must be <clears throat> broken up. The seed then has to be planted at the, at the precise place. It cannot just be planted anywhere. It has a, uh, a reason and a purpose where it's planted, and then we have to allow it to die, and then it goes down before it goes up. And as the seed germinates and takes root, the roots then establish a very complex system that send out feeder roots that in turn anchor the tree to the earth below and then create this network that provides the disposition of water and nutrients to the tree itself. We're not just to be someone who goes down. We're someone who goes down, spreads out, then goes up and makes a difference. We have a mission. We have a purpose. In the same way, Yehovah shows us how the spiritual and physical root Israel created life for the children of Israel and became the source of life for all mankind through the Messiah. If we look at Psalms chapter 80, verses 8 through 19, it says, The God of armies, restore us. Make your face shine, and we will be saved. You brought a vine out of Egypt. You expelled the nations and planted it. <clears throat> you cleared a space for it. Then it took root firmly and filled the land. So, what was God doing? Preparing a soil, creating the soil in order to be able to handle the root right? The plant. And then the root did what it was supposed to do. Correct? <clears throat> the mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. It put out branches as far as the seed and shoots to the Euphrates River. Why did you break down the vineyard's wall so that all passing by can pluck its fruit? The boar from the forest tears it apart while creatures from the fields feed on it. God of armies, please come back, look from heaven, see and tend the vine. Protect what your right hand planted. Who's the right hand of the Father? Yeshua. So Yeshua has planted you, right? Can't be planted unless you accept Yeshua. The sun you made strong for yourself. It is burnt by fire. It is cut down. They perish at your frown to rebuke. Help the man at your right hand, the son of man you made strong for yourself. Then we won't turn away from you. If you revive us, we will call on your name. So this is a picture not only of Israel's salvation through Messiah, but it's a picture of Israel. We cannot discard what God is doing with Israel. We cannot say <clears throat> Israel has no purpose because Israel is part of the tree, right? We are a wild olive tree, and we're, branches are cut off and what? And grafted in the tree of Israel, all right, <clears throat> where we can grow. So its root is strong. I mean, if you look at Israel's history, it's been trying try to be wiped out, and it has never been wiped out. There's other empires that have been wiped out. But Israel has not been wiped out, and it's had a good chance to be wiped out. But it can't be wiped out. Why? Because its root is strong and wide, and it gets its nutrients and water from a source that is powerful. So just as the root of the tree has two very specific functions, also the root of Yehovah's economy has two functions, this careful management of available resources. The root of Yehovah's standards serve to establish the covenant relationship with his people through the physical land uh, of Israel and also the spiritual salvation of Israel and all mankind through the Messiah. Where has your salvation come from? Has it come from Israel or has it come from Messiah? Yes. Why is it yes? Why does your salvation come through Israel? And the context that I'm talking about. Because the seed came through Israel. So therefore, without Israel, there is no seed. 
<clears throat> the seed was placed in the woman in the garden. Her seed, right? Her seed. So the seed, so God has to bring <clears throat> the natural and also the spiritual. Through the natural, he brings the spiritual. You can't have Messiah unless you have Israel. Oh, well, can't God do what he wants to do? Yes, and God did exactly what he wanted to do, right? Can God save everyone without a preacher? Yes. Will he? No. Why? How can anyone be saved without a what? Without a preacher. <clears throat> can he not prophesy by himself, or does he use people? He uses people, right? And so we have to understand <clears throat> that the physical land of Israel and the spiritual salvation of Israel and all mankind came through Messiah. And without the root from Jehovah going forth, planning salvation, making atonement for our sins, we would not be, or we would all be, condemned to separation from Jehovah for every inclination of our hearts are wicked. We needed Jehovah to do something for us. In Psalms chapter 5, <clears throat> verse 4, it says, For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. Evil cannot remain with you. Which is why God has to do what with us? Create in us a clean heart. He has to take the old and make it new. <clears throat> he might accept you the way you are, but he doesn't allow you to stay the way you are because he cannot allow evil to remain with him. If you want relationship with him, you have to work on the evil. He's given us grace and mercy that the blood of Yeshua has covered us, <clears throat> but it doesn't cover us to wink, wink, do what we want when we want to do it. So, Proverbs chapter 12, verse 3 also says, No one is made secure by wickedness, but the roots of the righteous will never be moved. Now, there may be many ways to kill a tree, but the most effective way to kill a tree is to uproot it. I've told you about my blue spruce that I have cut back time and time and time again, hoping that I would kill that thing. And I took it down to its to the ground, and it just kept coming back until finally I just say, welcome home. And I just let it sprout and grow. I don't care anymore. <clears throat> I did not take the opportunity to uproot it, so therefore, no matter what I put it through, it still came back. <clears throat> as long as you are rooted in Messiah, no matter what you go through, no matter what hell comes your way, no matter what the enemy unfolds and throws or hurls at you, if you are with the root, if you are holding on to the root, no matter how destroyed you seem to be, you'll grow again. For the life of the tree is where? In the root. The most important part of the tree is the soil. But the life of that tree is in the root. And without them, there is no foundation and no system of nourishment. Without a root, you cannot stand. And we know the story of the <clears throat> two houses, right? They both look the same. They're both built the same. The only difference is one has a root system, one does not. And when that same storm comes and hits them both, the one that has a root system does what? Remains. And the one who doesn't have a root system is destroyed. <clears throat> and then he talked about the seeds thrown on the parable of, this, of the sower and the seed. And those seeds that are thrown and not planted and do, are not allowed to have a root system, they end up being devoured, eaten, or dried up, or, or destroyed in any way. You know, when the immigrants came over from uh, <clears throat> the old world, they brought some of their plants and they would wrap in them cloth, the vines and wrap them in cloth. And they came over here and they cross pollinated those plants and those plants adapted and um, started to develop some different varieties of plants uh, and started to bear some good fruit that we enjoy today. That is a spiritual lesson. 
because in Proverbs 12, 12, the wicked covet the loot of evil men, but the root of the righteous gives forth of itself. And what God has done a lot of times in Israel's disobedience, what did he do to them in their disobedience? He dispersed them. And when he dispersed them, <clears throat> some came back, some did not come back, some stayed away. And those that stayed away or even while they were dispersed also cross-pollinated, right? And so now when he comes back, he's calling them from where? The north, the south, and the east, and the west. All of them that have been dispersed, where they have been dispersed, have created a variety. You're sitting here as a variety. Some of you have, <clears throat> maybe you're all Jewish. Some of you are just a little Jewish. Some of you just are half Jewish. Some of you uh, don't even know who you are. But you have something in you, right? Your DNA is not just one thing. You can't sit here and say, this is all I am. You are cross-pollinated, okay? So we see that Yehovah using the things of the natural to reveal supernatural insights to us. What he does is that <clears throat> he allows that so that when uh, we produce fruit come back, um, he has dispersed his people so that he can now transplant and then reserve from himself a remnant from the root. And then he raises a savior from that root. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 10 says, On the day uh, the root of Yisha, uh, which stands as a banner for the peoples, the goyim will seek him out, and the place where he rests will be glorious. The root of Jesse, right? The root of Jesse. Again, who's the root? Is it the Messiah or is it Israel? And the answer is yes. In Isaiah 53, 1 and 2, who believes our report? To whom is the arm of Adonai revealed? For before him he grew up like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He was not well formed or especially handsome. We saw him, but his appearance did not attract us. You know, when you look at that verse, you're like, oh, you would think if, you know, God brought him here, he could, you know, be handsome. It's not saying that he's ugly. What he's saying is he's not especially handsome. And again, we have to read between the lines because we always look on the outside and not the inside, correct? And the prophet Isaiah goes on to tell us that there was nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. So when we have a beautiful plant, especially in Virginia, <clears throat> you have these beautiful plants, and then fall comes, and what happens to those beautiful plants uh, they turn to even more beautiful sometimes with the leaves, but then what happens when winter comes? All falls down, and those beautiful, you know, people go to the, uh, to the mountains to see all the, the foliage, and you can go down the uh, trails and follow all those changing of the colors of the trees. <clears throat> but you don't see someone following in wintertime all the dead branches down the mountain, Correct. So when the beautiful leaves fall off the tree, <clears throat> we just pass them by. When they're on the tree, we look at them. They're beautiful. They're, they're wonderful. Yet the root goes deeper and no one sees. So where it really is the life? It's in the root. Nothing in its appearance is beautiful to us anymore. And a lot of times in our own lives, um, we, all, we want the robe of Joseph, Right? But what happened to the robe of Joseph? Here's Joseph wearing his nice, beautiful robe, the coat of many colors. But what happens to it? <clears throat> they take it and they tear it up and they <laughs> sew his coat of many colors, right? Or we want the garments of Solomon. And so <clears throat> when we don't have the garments of Solomon or the robes of Joseph, when everything's not going quite the way we want it to go, when we don't have as enough in the bank or relationships with each other are kind of shaky at best, then we kind of lose interest. As long as the church is hopping, but if you just had a dry spell or the, you know, as long as it was, you know, fear and faith series as opposed to um, the laws, 
in the study of the laws and the stipulations, uh, we lose interest. Prophet comes, we're all here. Healer comes, we're all here. But certain Bible study, eh, because we're looking for the beauty, right? But the power of the tree is not in its beauty. The power of the tree, it's in its root. So Jehovah shows us Messiah, and he tells us like a root out of dry ground, he has no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. And again, if we would listen to him, we wouldn't be attracted to him because he said, if I suffer, you will suffer. And if I die, you'll die. And your mother will hate you, and your father will hate you, and the in-laws will hate you, and your daughter will hate you, and your sons will hate you. <clears throat> How many want to join up and count the cost? There's no necessary beauty in that because beauty to us is that nothing ever happens to us that's bad and everything is wonderful and everything is glorious. We wake up smiling. We go to bed smiling. We smile even through the day. We don't have any pain in our body. Our mind is sharp, right? And it's not necessarily true all the time. But from the root will burst forth life in the natural and also in the supernatural. In Jeremiah chapter 17, 5 through 8, the scripture says, Thus says Adonai, Cursed is the one who trusts in man and depends on flesh as his arm, and whose heart turns from Adonai. For he will be like a bush in the desert. He cannot see goodness when it comes, but will dwell in parched places in the wilderness, a salt land where no one lives. Blessed is the one who trusts in Adonai, whose confidence is in Adonai, for he will be like a tree planted by the water, spreading out its roots by a stream. It has no fear when heat comes, but its leaves will be green. It does not worry in a year of drought, nor depart from yielding fruit. Why? The root. So you have confidence in Yehovah. Your root. Don't have confidence in what the day will bring. Don't have confidence in the money you have. Don't have confidence in where you live or what you drive or who you know or your friends. Have confidence in Yehovah because if all that is shaken and you go through a season of winter, right, or drought, and <clears throat> you don't have yielding fruit, has anyone ever felt just like you're just here? There's no fruit being bore, you're trying to figure out, you know, I don't have no joy, I don't have no Well, are you still beautiful? Is he still beautiful? Is he still wonderful? Is he still powerful? Is he still good? Yes. Why? Because it's the root. It's not in what you necessarily see. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, the scripture says, see to it that no one misses out on God's grace, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble and thus contaminates many. And usually, when does bitterness come? When the beauty of your life is gone. Right? A relationship is broken. Bitterness comes. <clears throat> uh, what you thought. You, don't, you, you know, someone out in the world can make you mad. You're not going to be too bitter because they made you mad. You're just going to blow them off. They made me mad. I'll never see them again. Bitterness <clears throat> starts to come because in relationships, things are happening. And that's where bitterness comes. When you have that friendship or that love, that extension, there's, there's a community, there's something that ties you to something or someone that you're tied to. That's what causes bitterness. You know, you love your house and you lost your house. That causes bitterness because you loved your house. If you didn't love your house and you lost it, you're like, well, I didn't like it anyway. Right? <clears throat> so it's about losing something that you love because you can't see the beauty of the root. And the root would be if you lost your house that you loved or your car that you loved or the relationship that you loved, who do you still have? Who is your, st who is your root? Which means something beautiful can come back again. So the ground is our heart. The seed is the word. The root is the Messiah. And Yehovah calls him a root, and out of dry ground, he brings forth a root that will give life to Israel and all mankind. Yeshua comes out of dry ground. He doesn't come in beauty. He doesn't come uh, especially handsome. He comes out of dry ground. <clears throat> the power of Yeshua is not what you see. 
It's who he is underneath the ground. So the tree of life, the etz, uh, Chaim, the word of Yehovah is the tree of life that contains the very key to eternal life, the word of God that gives us the power to be able to maintain and to live. As we look at that word of God and the passages that Yeshua quoted, we understand because we have some knowledge and you understand because you change your containers and, and you've uh, broken up the circular roots and you're growing uh, in a different direction, you're growing, growing larger, that Yeshua talked about a return to Torah. That's what he preached. His whole message was return to Torah. It wasn't against Torah. It was against the legalism of an oral Torah that, that had some stipulations and rules that wasn't necessary. But he preached about returning to Torah. It was from the Torah that Yeshua taught, and it is no coincidence that the Torah is mounted on the tree of life. It is referred to as that Etz Chaim, the, the tree of life. In Matthew 5, 17 through 19, he says, Don't think that I have come to abolish the Torah or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to complete. Yes, indeed, I tell you that until heaven and earth pass away, not so much as a yod or a stroke will pass from the Torah, not until everything that must happen has happened. So whoever disobeys the least of these mitzvah and teaches others to do so will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever obeys them and so teaches will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So as believers, we are to uphold the Torah, the instruction of the Word of God, the Word of God that is a root. And we do it by choice, like I said before, not under compulsion. Under choice, we embrace the wisdom of the Word of God. By choice, not compulsion, we herald the Word of Yehovah. We study the word of Yehovah. We like those, you know, read the Bible through in a year. <clears throat> but if anyone's ever done that, if you ever get behind a day or two, you start to feel the pressure, especially if it was five chapters a day. And now, for whatever reason, you're on vacation, you didn't read, or you're in a car or whatever, and now you realize, Lord, I am, I am six days behind Six times five is 30 chapters, and you feel that pressure, and so you do a one or two things. You throw out the Bible reading plan, or you just sit there, and in one setting, you read those 30 chapters, not knowing what you're saying, not knowing what you're reading, just so you can check that box, because there's nothing worse than having a blank box when you're supposed to do it on a daily basis. So it's not by compulsion, but it's by choice. Second Timothy chapter 2.15 says, Do all you can to present yourself to God as someone worthy of His approval, as a worker with no need to be ashamed, because He deals straightforwardly with the word of truth. Romans 2 also shows us that a Jewish person who embraces the Torah is doing what is expected, but a non-Jewish person who embraces the Torah, is called righteous. So as a Jewish person, it's a requirement that you embrace the Torah because that's what you've been taught. But if you're someone who has come from a different direction like us, and we made that turn, and <clears throat> we decide to follow Torah, and you've decided to follow Torah, uh, not because you were brought up Jewish, not because you were brought up in an orthodox uh, way, but you have decided out of obedience to do it, you are righteous. So in... Yehovah's economy, what he shows us in the natural is a shadow of what is in the supernatural, which is why we look at the tree of life. We see the soil. We see the seed. And now we see the root because it all has something to do with the very spiritual understanding of our lives. The root of the tree has two purposes. What were they? To absorb water and nutrients and to anchor the plant. <clears throat> Are you anchored? And are you getting enough water and nutrients? In the supernatural, the root is the Messiah in Israel. <clears throat> the Messiah is <clears throat> our root. Israel is our root. Who wrote the book? 
other than Yehovah, given the, by inspiration of the Spirit of God. <clears throat> the apostles wrote their letters. They wrote the Gospels. They wrote the epistles, right? The prophets, the, the ones who were following Yehovah, right? <clears throat> so coming through those 12 tribes, correct? Um, Joseph being an example of the Messiah, <clears throat> The, the root is the Messiah. You cannot replace the root. If we are going to go deep, then we have to allow the Messiah to take hold of our lives, and we must allow him to be our anchor, and this word has to be our anchor. And if you sever yourself from Israel, then you've severed yourself from an anchor. I'm not saying that Israel's all right, correct? But you don't sit here all right either. So our hearts must be turned to Israel for the restoration of his covenant land and his covenant people so the Messiah can then return. And how many want him to return? So let's look at what uh, Matthew 23, 37 through 39 says. <clears throat> Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you kill the prophets, you stone those who are sent to you. How often I wanted to gather your children just as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, but you refuse. Look, God is abandoning your house to you, leaving it desolate. For I tell you from now on, you will not see me again until what? You say, blessed is he who comes in the name of Adonai. So we've talked about eschatology. We talked about the second coming. <clears throat> you know why there cannot be a rapture and then seven years of tribulation where the Jewish people come to know Yeshua? Because he can't come until his people proclaim Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. When you see a revival happening with the Jewish people, which we do see a move of God happening with the Jewish people, but certainly not an, out, an outright revival. When you see a revival where, <clears throat> where massive Jewish people are calling on the name of the Lord, we're close. Because he's not coming back until his people do that. Because the root, the seed, the soil. Yehovah has instructed us with his word to embrace it as a tree of life, to take hold of it, to go out and make disciples. So, <clears throat> again, we have to be those who proclaim. We are to make Israel jealous, correct? How do we make them jealous? Well, we make them jealous by doing what they're supposed to be doing, but we also make them jealous by doing what they're supposed to be doing and then telling them about the Messiah. <laughs> you can't be quiet. No one knows what you're doing in your house. Right? <clears throat> so when they see a, a, a people, when we go to Israel and we're wearing our zits and we're talking about Yehovah and we're talking about Yeshua and we're loving and we're kind and we're reaching out, that's going to make a difference because we're supposed to make disciples. Remember, you cannot harvest if you don't plant and you cannot plant if you don't plow. Right? And the seed cannot germinate and take root if it does not have the right conditions. Our job is to make sure we have the soil that is proper, that we have the seed in its right conditions planted, right, being watered in the nutrients and so on and so forth, so that we can create a harvest because we are becoming the example of what Jehovah wants. <clears throat> so we have learned seven lessons from the root tonight. The first lesson that we've learned is like seeds, roots grow beneath the surface. It's not about the outward appearance, but what grows beneath the surface. Remember, all of Jesse's sons, king, 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 king. And what did God say? No, 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 no. And do you have any more sons? And what son did I have? Surely you don't want this son. Right now, he's a little man out there singing and dancing, playing a harp, and dancing with some sheep. <laughs> well, bring him here. Let me see. And when Samuel sees him, what does God say? That's the king, right? So we know that roots grow beneath the surface. Sometimes we look at <clears throat> the size of ministries and how a person walks and, and what they look like, and we gravitate toward the outward parts of people and ministries. But sometimes the root is rotting or bound, not good. Second thing that we learned about the roots is that the roots have the power to break through hard ground 
and we must be willing to persevere to break through the hard ground. In Romans chapter 5, 1 through 5, the scripture says, So since we have come to be considered righteous by God because of our trust, let us continue to have shalom with God through our Lord Yeshua the Messiah, also through him and on the ground of our trust we have gained access to this grace in which we stand. So let us boast about the hope of experiencing God's glory. But not only that, let us also boast in our troubles. How many of you ever boast about your troubles? Well, we mostly do. Complain about our troubles. And yet we're supposed to boast about our troubles because we know that trouble produces endurance. When's the last time you said, I'm so glad I'm in trouble today? I am so glad what I'm going through today. Because I know what I'm going through, I'm going to endure. That's not what we say. And then he says in verse 4, endurance produces what? Character. And character produces hope. And this hope does not let us down because God's love for us has already been poured out in our hearts through the Ruach HaKodesh who has been given to us. I'm a living testimony that even if you cover up a seed with asphalt or concrete, if it wants to, it will make its way out. <clears throat> Here's your hope. Even if the devil covers you with concrete, you can make your way out. And you just push through that concrete or asphalt. And it just starts a little bit, but guess what? What empowers you to push through the concrete or asphalt? The root, the power of the root. If the root wasn't getting water or nutrition, it would not have the strength. So don't worry about it. The next one, number three, the root takes the path that goes around obstacles. <clears throat> Listen, if the root hits the rock, it doesn't stop. It actually presses on until it goes over or under or around or actually through the obstacle in its path. That's the power of the root. Who lives inside of you? Yeshua. Look at Israel and all that they've been through. They've gone around. They've gone through. They, whatever. They, they make it. They, they're fighting. If you look at Israel the size of New Jersey and all the Islamic Muslims all around them <clears throat> and everyone around them is not their friend. You know, you might have one bad neighbor. And if you have one bad neighbor in a neighborhood, what do you do? You ignore the bad neighbor. But if you're in the middle of the neighborhood and all the neighbors around you don't like you, you feel a little intimidated. But the root takes the path that goes around the obstacle. Listen, <clears throat> spiritually understand what Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 through 14 says. It is not that I have already obtained it or already reached the goal. No, I keep what? Pursuing. What are we? We're pursuers, not retreaters. In the hope of taking hold of that for which the Messiah Yeshua took hold of me, brothers, I, for my part, do not think of myself as having yet gotten a hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind me and straining forward toward what lies ahead, I keep what? Pursuing the goal in order to win the prize offered by God's upward calling in the Messiah Yeshua. That's what a plant does whose root is the Messiah. Number four, the root seeks out water. So you have to seek out living water, the Word of God, the relationship with the Ruach, and we are to then live without fear. In 1 John chapter 4, 4, what does it say? You children are from God and have overcome the false prophets because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. The fifth thing that we've learned about roots is that roots become an anchor. The tree does not support the root. The root supports the tree, and I think we've got that all messed up. When we became a church, the church supports Israel. No, Israel supports us. If Israel goes, we go. If the land is demolished, we're demolished. Which is why God upholds Israel. And he says, you curse Israel, I curse you. You bless Israel, I bless you. Romans chapter 11, <clears throat> 17 through 
21. But if some of the branches were broken off and you, a wild olive, were grafted in among them and have become equal shares in the rich root of the olive tree, what are you sharing in? The root of the olive tree. Not the bigness of the olive tree, but what the olive tree has to offer, but the root. You share in the root. Then don't boast as if you were better than the branches. However, if you do boast, remember that you are not supporting the root. The root is supporting you. So you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. True. But so what? They were broken off because of their lack of trust. However, you keep your place only because of your trust. So don't be what? Arrogant. On the contrary, be terrified. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he certainly won't spare you. So we don't replace Jehovah's plan. We don't replace Jehovah's people. And number six, it is the complex root system that goes the deepest. Because if we are not growing, then we are dying. So we have to go deeper. And the last one, number seven, there is a direct correlation to the depth the breadth and height a tree can soar based on how deep, how complex, and how long its root is. You could be shallow, you could be small, you have no power. It's because of your root system. Understand this and understand it well. Yehoah does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. You're not sitting here because you were qualified. But you sit here now, and he's qualifying you. <clears throat> he didn't call David because he was qualified. He knew that if he called David, he would qualify him. All the other brothers thought they were qualified, right? He didn't call Miriam, or what we know is Mary, because she was qualified. She's a young girl, right? But he qualifies her when she's called. We must be faithful. We have to be obedient. In Revelation 22, as I get ready to close here, it says, I, Yeshua, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the Messianic communities. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. Let anyone who hears say, come. And let anyone who is thirsty come. Let anyone who wishes take the water of life free of charge. Who is the root? Yeshua is the root. In John 4, 13 and 14, Yeshua answered, Everyone who drinks this water will get thirsty, but whoever drinks the water I will give him will never be thirsty again. On the contrary, the water I give him will become a spring of water inside of him, welling up into eternal life. And we know that the more you get, the more you want. We know that the more we have, we're never satisfied. It's just the way, it's just the way it is. It's the way of the world, Right? But when you drink of him, you become satisfied because of where the root is and how the root supplies. In Matthew 10, 34 through 36, don't suppose that I have come to bring peace to the land. It is not peace I have come to bring, but a sword. Who's saying this? Yeshua. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law so that a man's enemies will be the members of his household. Thank you very much, God. He's not come to bring us together. He's come to bring a sword, a sword that separated us from a life of sin, hunger, thirst, and loneliness. The, the sword, the living word that separates both spirit and soul, bone and marrow, right? The desires of our hearts. So the reason why there's such conflict in a household is because some don't want to follow and some will follow. And what Yeshua knew was that when you start wanting to become what God wants you to become and you <clears throat> unbound your roots and you and you uh, get the sunlight and you have a relationship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, there's others that won't want to do that and there will be conflict. Don't think you can, again, you can't have seed mingle without conflict. I know we'd like to have it that way, but the Scripture says we can't, and Yeshua already told us, I have not come to bring you peace. I have come to bring a sword, to set a dividing line, 
You either want him or you don't want him. Choose today whom you will serve. The <clears throat> children of Israel, even before they left Egypt, while they left Egypt, in the middle of the wilderness, even when they got to the promised land, you could see there was a sword dividing them. Some still wanted to go with Jehovah. Some wanted to go back. <clears throat> some believed Moses. Some did not. And what did God do through all that? There was separation. Remember the, <clears throat> the tribe of Korah coming against the, uh, Moses and, and the uh, uh, other Israelites. We, we see division. Even Miriam is gossiping, talking about Moses. We see all that happening because there's a sword. We can have peace if we all follow Jehovah. But that's not happening right now, right? And as much as you preach and proclaim, <clears throat> uh, everyone makes a decision, a choice. And the reason why I know that is because you make your own choices, which is why sometimes even in your own life you don't have peace. So Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, the last verse, the last slide says, Come now, says Adonai, let's talk this over together. Even if your sins are like scarlet, they will be white as snow. Even if they are red as crimson, they will be like wool. Let's talk it over. You can have this freedom. You can be attached to the root. And when you're attached to the root, you become white as snow. You become uh, someone who's full of destiny, someone who's full of power, someone who has sources the root. If not, when the storm comes, you'll, you'll collapse. If the sun comes out, you'll be scorched, and you won't make it. So it's important that we understand the power of the root. The most important part of the plant is the soil, because without the proper conditions or cultivating of that soil, the seed will not be able to do what it's supposed to do. It will not be able to germinate. And the seed implanted in ideal conditions will die, then germinate, then seek nutrition, and seek water, spread out a base, and then come forth out of the ground. It creates a strong root system. You can't get any stronger than Messiah Yeshua. He never fails. He never leaves you. And the enemy is underneath his feet. Amen? All right, let's stand before Yehovah. sing of your love forever I could sing of your love forever I could sing of your love forever I could sing of your love forever over the mountains and the sea your river rocks with love for me so I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free I'm happy to be in the truth, so I will tell it in my hand, or I will always sing the wind your love came down. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing, I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love.
Enjoy the rest of your week. See you all on Sabbath. Hallelujah.